Well, hello and welcome to The Zone. I'm your host, Big Wave Dave. Big Wave Dave. Oh, yeah. Big Wave Dave. So tell us some more about Big Wave Dave. So in public schools in California and elsewhere, they often teach us that we evolved from ape-like creatures like Lucy here. But is that true? Of course! That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so let's get started. The scientific name for Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis. Let's look at some facts. Just the facts, ma'am. First of all, her name means Southern Ape. Now, Lucy was first discovered by Donald Johansson in 1974. And originally, this is all they found, about 40% of a complete skeleton. It was missing parts of the skull and the hands and feet. Now, since then, they have found more fossils, including some hands and feet, so they have a better idea of what Lucy's kind look like. So this is what we're taught. Scientists agree that Lucy is our ancestor, that she lived about four to five billion years ago, and that she walked like we do. They also tell us that scientists have proof that Lucy was our ancestor. No academic scientist ever said that Lucy was our grandmother. At most, they're referring to a potential ancestor. For example, let me show you what I said about this in another video from a couple years ago. That does not mean that anyone ever thought that that particular individual, Lucy, was the great-great-grandmother of all humanity. We're not looking for a direct ancestor. We're looking for a species that is morphologically intermediate between two closely related lineages, sharing characteristic traits from either or both and having some that are developed partway between the two. That's what a transitional species is, and we've shown many of them in this series already. A paleontologist rarely, if ever, describe one species as being directly ancestral to another, because there's always the possibility that we might find another species that is even closer. That wouldn't happen if creationism was true, but creationism is not true, so that actually happens quite a lot. However, the news media and even authors and editors of textbooks, who might not be scientists themselves, often do use that sort of language, unfortunately. There would be no way to prove whether Lucy's species was our direct ancestor because we can't retrieve DNA from her fossils. But we can prove that hers was the closest potentially ancestral species ever identified at that time and that she fulfilled a prediction that Darwin had made and described in detail a century earlier in his book on the descent of man. Back then, people were looking for an evolutionary chain of procession between humans and the apes that were known at that time. And Darwin described exactly what features we should expect to find. They had already found fossils of Neanderthals, an earlier breed of humans. They were more ape-like than we are, but they were still obviously people, and that's why they were called Homo neanderthalensis, Homo being the taxonomic name for human. However, Neanderthals were not ancestral to us. They were more like the older brother to Homo sapiens. They're one of many side branches that don't belong in this linear chain. But in 1891, scientists found Homo erectus, initially called Pithecanthropus erectus, because they were so ape-like that scientists didn't at first recognize them as a very primitive form of people. If Neanderthals were the older brother of Homo sapiens, then Homo erectus is the granddaddy of all humanity, and the recently discovered Homo bodoensis would be our dad, the intermediate link between us. Homo erectus was everywhere. Their remains have been recovered in Africa and in the Middle East, in Southern Europe and Asia and Indonesia, lasting from 2 million years ago to about 100,000 years ago. And their brain size ranged from barely bigger than that of a chimps to the lower end of modern humans. There were other distinctly human species in the fossil record, too. In 1964, they found an even earlier form of human, Homo habilis, closely associated with, and possibly the same thing as, Homo rudifensis. Now, on the other side of that evolutionary chain, which is an antiquated concept that we don't use anymore, but I have to to explain what Darwin was talking about, as he pointed out, we were not derived directly from modern apes, but from a common ancestor with them. At that time, the closest known contender was a Dryopithecus, some of whom were already bipedal, even before chimpanzees evolved. As of 2002, we have a much closer match in Sahelanthropus chedensis, although that one already shows some evolution in the human direction and may be bipedal too. Remains of this species were dated to 7 million years or so ago, just before our divergence from the lineage leading to chimpanzees. 
The way we know that is according to comparative genomics and estimates of significant mutation rates, known as the molecular clock, which put our common ancestor with the chimpanzees as living between six and seven million years ago. This is how genetics and paleontology independently collaborate to correlate and confirm the same data. In the early part of the 20th century, there were folks hoping that their first humans had evolved in their home countries, in England or the U.S., but Darwin had correctly predicted that the missing link in this chain would be found in Africa. Australopithecus africanus was discovered in 1924, but it was filed away and not properly analyzed until decades later. It had a mix of human and ape features, including strong evidence that it was bipedal too, but that fact wasn't identified or described until after afarensis was discovered in 1974. So even though both of these others also qualify, Lucy was the one to become famous as the no longer missing link. But since then, they found yet another link for an earlier species, Artipithecus ramidus, seen as a first step toward the human form from that of a traditional ape. And although she was more similar to chimpanzees, she too had indications in the skull and the pelvis of upright walking. And these are just the species that appear to be a fluid sequence seamlessly connecting humans and apes. There are many more species branching off of different links in this so-called chain because evolution is better depicted as a branching tree pattern. Importantly, you have to remember that whether they are part of our direct lineage or not, all of these identified hominins meet the criteria of transitional species because all of them have a blend of human and ape characteristics, and in that sense, all of them are intermediate. But hang on, here's what they're not telling you. All scientists do not agree that Lucy was our ancestor. Even evolutionists don't agree about that. And why is that? Because out of all those dozens of so-called ape men, there was one discovered in 1999 that may even be closer to our lineage than Lucy was, and that is Kenyanthropus platyops. And it's good that they named it that, because it's not Australopithecus anymore, and it's not human yet either, but it might actually be both at once, and is thus a perfect example of a transitional intermediate. It's so close to us that this ape just might qualify as the earliest form of human. Yeah, Bisbee will tell you that the scientists don't agree, but he won't tell you why they don't. Because he wants to give you the impression that maybe some of these scientists think evolution never happened at all. Bisbee knows better than that, but he doesn't want you to know that. He certainly doesn't want you to know that there were all these other transitional species out there, and that one of them might even be closer to that imagined dividing line than Lucy is. Also, when you look at the fossil evidence, which we're going to do in just a minute, it shows that she was most likely just an extinct ape. If you actually do look at the fossil evidence with some competence, understanding something of anatomy, paleoprimatology, and evolutionary theory, none of which Bisbee has because he's only an electrician, if he's qualified even to do that, then you'll see that Lucy is definitely not just an extinct ape. She was a hominin, not just an ape, but an ape who was almost human. And more importantly, neither her species nor any of the many other hominins should even exist if creationism was true. They would only exist if evolution is true. And since humans and apes were already so similar that taxonomists were forced to classify us together just on physical characteristics even before we had genetic proof of our relationship, then having any of these hominin species be even closer to us, more similar, completely erases the imaginary line between us showing that we and all the other apes are in fact the same family, which we are, both literally and taxonomically. We no longer distinguish humans from apes because we now understand that humans are apes. And finally, sculptures like this one here and some videos can be very misleading. So I wanted to show you an example of that. This video was put together by Donald Johansson. And as you watch it, I want you to listen very carefully to what the narrator says. Are you ready? Okay, here it goes. We now have 400 specimens of Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis, named after the Afar region. And uh, we know that there are very large individuals, which were males, and the smaller ones uh, are certainly female. So if you're listening, the narrator said that they have found 400 specimens. And they show these 400 Lucys just marching down the street. Waha! Just having a good time, right? Like a parade or something. But do they really have 400 skeletons? No, they don't. Here's what they have. Talk about misleading. Bisbee just showed what he labeled the entire Hadar collection. And he even said that this is all we have. Even though the title indicates that these are just the fossils from Hadar, Ethiopia. 
Afarensis fossils were also found in three other locations in Ethiopia and four more in Kenya and Tanzania. So Bisbee is misleading you. See how this picture shows only one pelvis? That's Lucy's. So where is the pelvis for the male Afarensis, known as Kadanumu? He was discovered in the same area in 2005, but his remains are not in this photo. I guess creationists are still using outdated sources. And notice how the video said they had 400 specimens, but Bisbee changed specimens to skeletons so that he can try to imply that it's the scientists who are trying to mislead you rather than him. Now they found some fingers and toe bones and some more skull fragments, but most of what they have are just fragments and teeth. They certainly don't have those skeletons. That's why, in my opinion, that video is very misleading. If all you found were finger bones, do you think maybe there was a whole hand there originally? I mean, you can't have a finger grow by itself. You can't have finger bones unless they grew out of a hand, right? I mean, you can have an ape without fingers. I mean, that can happen due to birth defects or tragic industrial accident, maybe washing your hands too close to the crocodiles. But you can't have fingers growing by themselves without the ape attached to them. And that means that even if you've only got part of its hand, you know there was once a whole living individual there. Then if you find more fragments a mile or two down the road, or in the next country over, then that's another individual. And if you find more fragments in 400 locations, that's 400 individuals. And what's the point of arguing that these specimens are just fragments? If you find but a few fragments in the right place, you might be smart enough to see how they go together, like in this partially assembled skull. And here's another one. Another individual made of different fragments, because geologic pressures are brutal and most fossils break. And these fragments wouldn't make sense to an electrician like Bisbee. We saw that in the last episode. This is what they found. I don't know about you, but that kind of looks like E.T. or something like that. I mean, this is just what a mash of bones here, right? You don't know what you're talking about. I'm sure Bisbee has picked up lots of fossils and tossed them aside thinking they were just weird looking rocks because it takes a highly trained eye to recognize fossils of broken bones. And when I was in the field, I found a part of a femur, and the scientist behind me found the rest of it just a few feet away. And they fit together perfectly, just like they should. But you don't always get that lucky. And you have to know your stuff, or else you won't recognize anything. And what is the point in Bisbee trying to imply that there weren't really 400 of these things? If you found one, wouldn't that mean that there had to be others like it? Even in the young earth creationism view, if you have a species at all, you would have to be more than 400 individuals. And that's just if you're talking about the ones that are alive all at the same time. Bisbee admits that Lucy existed, though he doesn't know what she was, and he tries to pretend she was something else. So he should admit that there were at least a few hundred more like her. But no, he says all that to mislead you into thinking that we don't have any skeletons, ignoring the fact that the very first one ever found was a skeleton, and that's not the only one. Sure, those we have may be only 40% complete, but that's enough to tell that they were bipedal, and that's what Bisbee's problem is. This Sunday school pseudoscientist thinks that if an ape walks upright like we do, then it's human. He's almost right. We're almost that close. So he has to pretend, yes, pretend, that either hominins never existed, or they couldn't walk like us. Because if they did, then he wouldn't be able to dismiss them as something else, the way his belief system forces him to do because his belief system won't let him admit the truth. Okay, let's look at some evidence. We're gonna look at the skull, the hands, the fingers, the wrist bones, the toes and feet, and finally, the pelvis. Skull on the left is human. The skull on the right is Lucy's skull. Do you see any differences? Well, there ought to be, or it wouldn't be evolution, would it? I mean, Lucy lived some 3,200,000 years ago. So you would expect there to be some changes in all that time between then and now. Well, let's take a closer look, okay? This is a replica of a human skull. Hello there. And a couple of things I noticed. Right off the bat, you can notice how flat the face is here. And you can look at the teeth and the eye sockets. But what really catches my eye is the size of this brain cavity. Got a really big brain cavity. Why? Because humans have big brains. We're really smart. Well, most of us anyway. Bless your heart. <laughs> All right. So let's look at Lucy's skull. Wow, this is so different. So right away I noticed the brow ridges, really pronounced. And look at that face. Look how sloped it is. 
But what really seems to be different is the, the skull cavity here. Look how small the brain cavity is. Clearly, we are much different than Lucy. Bisbee's argument is that Lucy cannot represent a transition between humans and apes because she's not human. She's different from us, which of course she would have to be if she's a transition. So of course we're different. If we were the same, then they wouldn't have said that they found a transitional species, would they? Instead, they would have just said that they'd found a human. So I have a question for you. Does Lucy's skull look more like the human skull or this, a bonobo skull, which is like a chimpanzee? She looks like a midpoint between them, with the face not quite as projected as the bonobo, with reduced canines even in males. Chimpanzees and gorillas used their long fangs as sexual combat displays, but hominins were significantly weaker and had smaller fangs, and they had to use weapons like rocks and spears instead. And chimpanzees use such weapons on occasion too, especially when they go to war against each other, being the only species besides humans who actually wage war against their own species. But hominins didn't have any other options, owing to a reduction in muscle mass, most notably in the jaw. Geneticists have identified the mutation responsible for that, by the way, and that mutation is also tied to later encephalization or enlargement of the brain. All right, which one do you think? Well, that's pretty easy. It looks a lot more like the bonobo skull. So to help you remember this, Lucy's skull was sloped and ape-like. You also need to remember that she was a transitional species, with many features roughly halfway between that of humans and familiar apes like chimpanzees. Remember that Lucy lived some 3.2 million years ago, and that our divergence from what would become chimpanzees was at least another 3 million years before that. So you can see that Lucy is morphologically right in the middle of these two forms. Look inside the mouth and you can see that there's a reduction in the depth of the maw, leading to a flatter face. But even though our mouths got smaller, we still had the same number of teeth. And even though they are a bit smaller too, there's not room for all of them anymore, which is why so many people suffer and die from impacted wisdom teeth, something an intelligent designer could have avoided. But the most important feature here is the foramen magnum, the hole in the skull that the spinal cord goes into. It goes into the back of a chimpanzee's skull because that's the optimum position for quadrupeds. If you get down on your hands and knees, you have to look up to see forward. But in humans, that hole has moved to beneath the skull, the optimal position for bipeds. If chimpanzees' heads were mounted that way, then when they're on all fours, they'd be looking down. Again, we see that Australopithecus is intermediate, with the foramen magnum moving to beneath the skull. The, that position doesn't work for quadrupeds. Instead, it is just one more fact that she definitely walked upright. Let's move on. So have you ever watched an ape at the zoo? They are so funny. And I love it when they swing from ropes like this. Now look how good he can do that. Now the reason he's so good at that is God gave apes curved fingers and hands. It helps them swing from trees. What that gibbon was doing, swinging from its arms, is called brachiation. It's an adaptation that distinguishes apes from other catarines because regular monkeys can't do this with the full shoulder rotation that only apes can. That's why the ability to brachiate is a diagnostic feature of all apes. So if we look at the statue of Lucy that was at the museum, they show her hand being very human-like. Yeah, it's dirty and it needs a manicure, but it does look like a human hand. Is that what Lucy's hand really looked like? Ah, fact, Lucy's fingers were long and curved and designed for hanging from trees. The scientists say it even looked like a chimpanzee's hand. It's obvious that Bisbee didn't read the study he just cited because it directly contradicts all his conclusions. What it actually says is that some of the elements of the hand of Australopithecus afarensis show similarities to humans, while others are more like those of common chimpanzees. Which is, of course, exactly what you would expect if she was a transitional species. But Bisbee isn't going to tell you that part. So Lucy's hands were curved and ape-like. Remember that Lucy is only halfway between humans and familiar apes like bonobos and chimpanzees, whose hands already look very much like human hands, even with that slight curvature. Human hands can look like ape hands, too. Look at this guy's fingers and see what mere discoloration can do to a gorilla's hand. And notice the fingernails, also, a diagnostic trait of old-world monkeys like us. But something apes have in addition to that is that we also have uniquely distinctive fingerprints. 
It really, the only visible difference in our hands versus those of living apes is that their thumbs are smaller. But as you can see in this reconstruction, Lucy had a larger thumb, more like our hands than any other living ape. Oh, I love this. Have you ever seen an ape knuckle walk? It's amazing how fast they can go. You see, God designed them to go on all fours like this. Then God did a shitty job because it is so much more efficient to walk upright. A human burns 50 calories walking three kilometers, where a chimpanzee, emulating on all fours, burns 140 calories over that same distance, nearly three times as much. And that's one of the reasons that chimps and gorillas cannot travel as far as humans can, nor can they go as fast for that long, because they tire too quickly. Now this is curious, because practically all other quadrupedal mammals of similar size could easily outrun humans over that same stretch. If you specialize, you'll do one thing really well. Apes, however, are generalized, able to do lots of different things, but maybe not all that well. And chimpanzees have the advantage of torque on the takeoff, so in a three kilometer race with a human, they might get an early lead, but we can run marathons, and we could overtake them before they get to that finish line. Now the reason apes can do that so easily is they have special wrist bones that lock into place for knuckle walking. Now you and I, we don't have that, so if you try that, it's gonna hurt. Okay, now what about Lucy? What did her wrist bones look like? You guessed it, Lucy's wrist bones could lock into place for knuckle walking. As you can see in this illustration, Australopiths and chimpanzees didn't have special bones that we don't have. They have the same bones that we do. It's just that the edge of theirs is slightly more curved, and that is what allows for their wrist to lock. However, the study that Bisbee himself cited moments ago said that Australopiths lack both transverse dorsal ridges and dorsally expanded articular surfaces on the metacarpal heads, features that are functionally linked with knuckle walking. And just to make that explicitly clear, they repeat that there is no indication in the head or metacarpals of an existing knuckle walking habitus, nor of an immediate heritage of terrestrial digitigrady. In other words, the experts studying these fossils assure us Lucy did not walk on her knuckles. Instead, the study says over and over again that there is no dispute over the fact that terrestrial bipedality was a far more significant component of the behavior of Australopithecus afarensis than any living non-human primate. Their arms were long for a human, but still within the human range, and so short that knuckle walking wasn't really an option for them. So, okay, I've got a question. If Lucy walked upright, like we do, then why does she have hands that are curved and ape-like, and wrist bones that could lock into place for knuckle walking? Sure seems like Lucy spent a lot of time in trees. Again, the study that Bisbee himself cited, but apparently did not read, explained a couple aspects of sexual dimorphism in this species, wherein the smaller ones, particularly the mothers and children, would likely spend more time in the safety of the trees when these were available. But at the time that she lived, that area was no longer a jungle canopy, but more sparsely wooded, where there wouldn't have been that many trees anymore. The study also says that male Australopiths were much larger, too big to stay in the trees, and therefore habitually terrestrial. And it says that these large males walked much more like we do. All right, so we have looked at the skull, the hands and the fingers, the wrist bones. Let's talk about toes and feet. So the feet on this statue look like people feet. That looks like a human foot. Yeah, it's nasty and probably stinks, but that looks like a human foot. But is that what Lucy's feet really look like? What do the fossils say? Fact, Lucy's toe bones were long and curved even compared to apes. That same study that Bisbee has now cited repeatedly was done almost 40 years ago in 1983. And they said then that the extraordinary curvature of some of this material was likely due, at least in part, to breakage and distortion of the fossil, which can happen as geologic pressure can even flatten fossils. More recent studies of newer discoveries give a different indication, saying that Lucy's feet were mostly human and that she couldn't climb trees much better than we could. And we know what long curved feet and hands are good for, climbing in trees, right? Except that these are their footprints obviously walking bipedally through a layer of 3.6 million year old volcanic ash. Notice how the big toe is not quite as aligned as it is on human feet, but it's clearly on the way there. Bisbee's favorite citation said that although chimpanzees do not walk on the ground with their thumb toe splayed out, 
Neither can they bring theirs as close to the big toe as the Australopiths could. The bottom line is Lucy did not have human feet. So if you wanted to know what Lucy looked like as she went around town, I imagine this is it. There she is, out cruising, looking for bananas or whatever she's up to, having a good time. Look at those hands and feet. Again, the study that Bisbee cherry-picked mind quotations from clearly says that Lucy could not have done this. Instead, it says that the foot and ankle remains reveal to us an animal that engaged in climbing as well as bipedality, that the fossil suggests a foot skeleton that trends in the human direction, but which also preserves a number of arboreal features, that Lucy had plantigrade bipedal feet with load-bearing capability and reduced potential to move her toes although she did retain some ability to move the thumb on her feet to become like the big toe on ours. In other words, even her feet were intermediate between humans and chimpanzees. She could move her toes a little better than we can, but not as well as the other apes can. So did Bisbee just read this report and pick out the two sentences that he liked and just pretend that it never said all the rest of this stuff? Were the experts doing the hands-on analysis always contradict him? Let's finish up with this, the pelvic bones. Have you ever seen an ape walk on two legs? It's actually kind of funny. They look like a baby with a full diaper walking back and forth, right? Why do they walk like that? Darwin noticed how ungainly chimpanzees and gorillas were, and he attributed this to their being in that awkward phase between quadrupedal and bipedal locomotion, where they're not that good at either one because they can't gallop anymore and they don't have the necessary modifications to be able to run like us yet. For example, Lucy's thigh muscles were in an intermediate position between humans and other apes like chimpanzees and gorillas, and she could walk better than them because she also had a valgus knee and an Achilles tendon and three arches in her feet, just like we do, whereas chimpanzees have none of that and therefore can't walk for long distances like hominines could. Why don't they walk like we do? It's because they have very different hip and pelvic bones. So, what did Lucy have? You guessed it. Lucy's pelvic bones were very similar to chimpanzees. You guessed wrong. Like so many of her other features, Lucy's pelvis was intermediate between chimpanzees and humans, and hers was closer to ours, being bowl-shaped with sagittally oriented iliac blades to strengthen the pelvic floor so that our organs don't fall out when we're standing up or you know, even jumping up and down. Her pelvis also provided attachment sites for gluteal muscles, both maximus and minimus, each being vital to bipedal running. Lucy evidently had both, just like we do, but chimpanzees have neither. They suffer from a condition that my hillbilly family once described as a vitamin deficiency, no acetal. Now, evolutionists know that that's a problem. She could not have walked like we do if she doesn't have the right kind of hips. So they've come up with a fix. Now, this video I'm about to show you was on PBS Nova, and I want you to pay close attention to what the narrator says. Are you ready? Here we go. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilized. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, 
but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Okay, welcome back. So if you listened carefully, we heard the narrator say that Dr. Lovejoy restored her pelvis to what it looked like before Lucy died. Um, I have a question. How does Dr. Lovejoy know what Lucy looked like before she died? Was he there? Did he meet her? Obviously not. Hello everybody, my name is Erica, or Gutsa Gibbon. I am a PhD student here at the University of Redacted, so that I don't dox myself accidentally. I'm in one of our many labs here with the uh, a model cast of Lucy's pelvis, or Australopithecus afarensis, and I'm here to dispel some rumors about the infamous video that is frequently shown by young Earth creationists to to sully, attempt to sully the work of Donald Johansson and his team when it comes to the reconstruction of the pelvis of this species. Creationists like to suppose that the correct reconstruction of Australopithecus afarensis's pelvis would have it end up looking something like this chimpanzee pelvis here with a very tall ilium very narrow um, overall pelvis uh, and a pubic synthesis down here below the sacrum unfortunately for them the way that the reconstruction has been classically done is indeed <laughs> a correct one. The way we know this, the way we know that Donald Johansson's uh, team's reconstruction of the pelvis of Lucy in particular, but they tend to forget that there are also many other pelvic remains from this species, from Australopithecus afarensis, but also other Australopithecus species like Australopithecus sediba, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus gari, etc. But we're just here to talk specifically about Lucy's pelvis and the reconstruction job that they did. We know that it's correct because anatomically, this thing could not have been reconstructed as a knuckle walker. If they were correct, the creationists were correct, and the pelvis of Australopithecus afarensis was more shaped like a chimpanzee, this pubic synthesis in the middle would be gapped by about six inches because you would have to actually lengthen the, the ilium and the ischium in order to get the desired shape to force this interpretation of a knuckle walker. And Lucy's, as a species, fetuses would literally be falling out of them because you would have uh, a, an anatomically impossible shape for the pelvis. The actual reconstruction was done in such a way to yield a biomechanically possible organism, and when done in this fashion, what you end up with is definitively a bull-shaped pelvis with a, a uh, sagittally oriented iliac blade uh, and, and a biomechanically sound creature that has um, a necessitation for bipedality. This thing was definitively a biped. Um, the, the Don Johansson <laughs> classic Nova special video that creationists show with the buzz saw in the background kind of trying to, to dunk on reconstructions in general, I guess, is very infamous in my department. We all laugh about it at any and every opportunity. It should be noted, too, that Australopithecus afarensis is known to be a biped for many other reasons, not just related to the pelvis, which was definitively bull-shaped and reconstructed correctly as detailed previously, but also because we can compare it to other remains that we have. But we also know it was a biped because of the nature of the valgus knee, the ventral or anterior foramen magnum, and of course, the foot morphology. This has been Erica Argutzik Gibbon. Thanks. In fact, other evolutionists have a problem. They said that he overestimated his reconstruction. That doesn't matter because that's not the only Australopithecine pelvis we have and that we can compare to. We also have the pelvis of Katanumu, who is another afarensis. And we have the pelvises of other species, too, like Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus africanus, and even the robust Australopithecines as well, Paranthropus robustus, and the prior incarnation, Ardipithecus ramidus. Without need of reconstruction, they have all been confirmed to be fully bipedal, that they only walk on two legs, just like we do, and ambulating on all four legs on the ground would be as awkward for them as it is for us. I feel like I need to talk very briefly too about the morphologic differences between the chimpanzee, which has the chimpanzee pelvis has these coronally oriented iliac blades and the pubic synthesis is far below the sacrum. Compare that to what we see in Lucy's pelvis where the pubic synthesis actually is somewhat in line with the sacrum or with the tailbone. 
um, this thing could not be reconstructed without actually creating new bone <laughs> in order to have enough material to stretch it downwards to allow for this knuckle walking interpretation. Okay, final round, final wrap up. Here we go. What was Lucy? Well, based upon the evidence, here's what we know. Lucy's skull was sloped and ape-like. Lucy's hands were curved and ape-like. Lucy's wrist bones could lock into place for knuckle walking. Lucy did not have human feet. And the pelvis was so badly smashed that we're really not quite sure what it looked like. Liar! And finally, this is Lucy's family. Forget all about those skeletons that you saw. Yet the study you cited says exactly the opposite, concluding that, in our opinion, Australopithecus afarensis is very close to what can be called a missing link. It possesses a combination of traits entirely appropriate for an animal that has traveled well down the road toward full-time bipedality, but which retains some structural features that enabled it to use the trees efficiently for feeding, resting, sleeping, or escape. Was she our ancestor? Nah, not a chance. The Bible got it right. We were created in God's image. The Bible never got anything right. There's no truth to it, which is why religious apologists have to rely on anything and everything but the truth. Aren't you glad you didn't evolve from ape-like creatures? I know I am. Then I have some bad news for you. We are still apes, and we are still evolving. You were never a magically animated mud golem such as you pretend to be. So why does this even matter? I mean, why is it such a big deal? Well, what we believe affects our decisions. Let me show you an example. If we evolve from ape-like creatures, who determines right from wrong? We do. Now, if God created us and the Bible is right, then God determines right and wrong. But the Bible is not right, fortunately. And I'm not going to go into all the reasons why just now. Only that some of the things that the Abrahamic version of God does or rewards are objectively evil. So it's a good thing he's not real. But the problem is, a lot of people in this country and elsewhere have decided that science has disproven the Bible and we can do whatever we want. I can do any goddamn thing I want. Science has disproved the Bible, but that doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. We still have to adhere to the moral standard that is and always was determined by human society. You know what? That's not going so well. Oh, I know. The vast majority of violent crimes, abuse, child molestation, terrorism, etc. are committed by religious extremists. The most religious areas have the highest crime rate, and the countries with the least religion have the lowest crime rate and are usually the best places to live. If you look around, we have a lot of problems in this world. But the one that bothers me the most is this. We have a lot of people turning away from God because they don't believe the Bible. Good. They'll be better off for it. And so will society as a whole. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to take all the people that love him to a very special place called heaven. The problem is that people that don't believe the Bible usually don't believe in Jesus. And they won't get to go. And that really bothers me. The Bible has, as Mark Twain described, upwards of a thousand lies. Wherein Jesus promised to return very soon during that generation, while some of his apostles were still alive. So he's over 1,900 years late, and you're still waiting? You've been stood up. He ain't coming. Good thing, too, because the vast majority of people around the world don't believe as you do. And you worship an unjust tyrant who, if he existed, would damn most of the people on the planet to a relentless eternal torture without any possible justification whatsoever. Unfortunately, there is no hell. And there is no heaven either, and it's not really a place you'd want to go once you start to think about the inescapable eternity and the mental state that you'd have to be in for all that time. No thanks. I'd literally rather just die and stay dead. So our goal here at The Zone is to help strengthen your faith so much that you are confident in sharing Jesus. What you're admitting, Mr. Bisbee, is that it doesn't matter to you what the truth is. All that matters is what you can make the kids believe. And getting them to read the Bible only makes them reject it faster. 
So what else can you do? Accept reality? <laughs> no, no, you're not going to do that. Instead, you did what all apologists do. Just like Reverend Martin Luther, father of Protestant Christianity, you read Romans 3.7 and you wondered. Then you made your video where you mined some quotations out of context from this study you cited and ignored everything else it said that proves you wrong. You did that claiming that this is what the evidence shows, knowing that it doesn't show that at all, quite the opposite in fact. And what I don't understand, Mr. Bisbee, is how you and all other apologists conduct themselves this way, and yet you're surprised to see people leaving religion in droves when they see what you're doing, and the depths you'll go to to defend an awful fable that we all know isn't really true. <laughs>